From the CUBE studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a CUBE Conversation. Hi everybody, welcome to this CUBE Conversation. This is Dave Vellante, and as part of my CEO and CXO series, I've been bringing in leaders around the industry, and I'm really pleased to have Sudish Nair, who is the CEO of ThoughtSpot, CUBE alum. Great to see you again, Sudish. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure, Dave. Thank you so much for having me. Hope everything is well with you and your family. Yeah, ditto, ba you know, back at you. I, I know you guys were in a hot spot for a while, so you know we, we power on together. So I got to ask you, so you guys, you guys are AI specialists, you know, maybe sometimes you can see things before they happen. At what point did you realize that this you know, COVID-19 was really going to be something that would affect businesses globally and then specifically your business? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, we used to think that Silicon Valley, we are sitting at the top of the world, AI and artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud, uh, uh, IoT, and all of a sudden, this little virus comes in and put us all in our places, basically. We are all waiting for doctors and others to figure these things out so we can actually go outside. That tells you all about uh, what is really important in life sometimes. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a hard uh, journey for most people because of what a huge health event this has been. Uh, from Silicon Valley point of view, and specifically from artificial intelligence point of view, um, there is not a lot of history here that we can use to predict the future. However, uh, early February, uh, we had our sales kick off and we had uh, a lot of our uh, sellers who came from Asia. And it became sort of clear to us immediately during our sales kick off in Napa Valley that uh, this is not like any other event, uh, the sort of things that they were going through in Asia. Uh, we sort of realized immediately that uh, as and uh, when it gets to the shores of US, uh, uh, this is going to really hurt. So we started hunkering down as a company, but um, as you mentioned early when we were talking, California in general had a head start. Uh, so uh, we've been hunkered down for almost five weeks now uh, as a company and as a people. And uh, the results are showing, you know, it's somewhat contained. Now, obviously the real question is uh, what next? How do we go out? but mm. that's going to be the next journey. So a lot of the executives that I've talked to, of course they start with the number one importance is the health and well-being of our, of our employees. We set up the work from home infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, I think, you know, been fairly well played in the, in the media and beginning to understand that pretty well. Also, you know, you saw, I talked to Frank Slootman and he you know, sort of joked uh, about the Sequoia memos that you know, yeah. eliminate uh, unnecessary expenses. Frank says, I've always eliminated unnecessary expenses, keep it to the essentials. But one of the things that I haven't probed with CEOs, and I'd love your thoughts on this is, did you have to rethink sort of the uh, ideal customer profile and, and, and your value proposition in the specific context of COVID? Was that something that you, 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 you know, deliberately did? Yeah, so it's a really important question that you asked. And, um... I saw the Frank interview and I 100% agree with that. Inside the company, we have uh, this saying, uh, you know, our co-founder Ajit actually coined the phrase of living like a middle-class company. Uh, and we've always lived that, even though we have you know, 300 plus million dollars in the bank and we raised a big round last year. Uh, it is important to know that as a growth stage company, we are not measured on what's in the bank. It's about the value are we delivering and how much are we able to collect from customers uh, uh, to run the business. So living like a middle-class family has always been the ethos of the company, and that uh, has been a good thing. However, uh, I've been with ThoughtSpot for a little more than 18 months. I joined as the CEO, I was an early investor in the company, and there are a couple of big changes that we made uh, in, the, in the last 18 months, and one of them uh, is moving to cloud, which we can talk. The other one uh, has been around narrowing our focus on who we sell to. Because one of the things that, as you know very well, Dave, is that the world of data is uh, extremely complex. Every company can come in and say, we have the best solution out there and it can just change the world. But the reality is uh, not, no single product is going to solve every problem for a customer when it comes to a data analytics issue. All we can hope for is that we become part of a, a package of solution that solves a very specific problem. So in that context, there's a lot of services involved, a lot of understanding of customer problems involved. We are not a BI product in the sense of Tableau or Click and Microsoft, what they do. We are about you know, use case based outcomes. So we knew that we can't be everywhere. So the second change we made is actually narrow our focus to exclusively sell to global 2000. That 
plus the middle class mentality really paid off now because almost all the customers we sell to are very large customers. And the four vert verticals that we were seeing tremendous progress, one was uh, healthcare, second was financial sector, third was uh, a telecom and uh, a manufacturing, and the last one is retail. Out of these four, I would say manufacturing is the one where we have seen slowdown, but the other uh, verticals have been, uh, you know, I would say cautiously spending, being very responsible. And uh, thought spot, we, I'm not here to say that everything is fine, but the impact, uh, if you take Zoom as a spectrum, one end of the spectrum where everything is going amazingly well because they're good product market fit to hospitality industry on the other side, I would say ThoughtSpot and our approach to data analytics is closer to this than that. That's very interesting, Sadish, because you know, of course, healthcare, you know, I don't think they have time to do anything right now. I mean, they're just so overwhelmed. So that's obviously a, an interesting area that's going to continue to do well, I would think. And then, you know, the financial services guys, there's a lot of liquidity in the system. And, 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 and after 2009, the FinTech guys or, or, or the financial you know, the banks are doing quite well. They may squeeze you a little bit because they're smart negotiators, uh, but as you say, manufacturing with the supply chains and in retail, you know, look, if you're e-commerce, I mean, Amazon hit, you know, all time highs, you know, today up, whatever, 20% in the last two weeks. I mean, just amazing what's happening. So it's really, you know, specific parts of those sectors will continue to do well, won't they? Absolutely. I think, look, uh, I saw this joke on Twitter, you know, what's the number one cost for digital transformation? Very soon people will say it is COVID. And uh, even businesses that have been tried to sort of relative, you know, reluctant to really embrace the transformation that the customers have been asking for, this has become the biggest forcing function. And, and, and that's actually a good thing because consumers are going to ultimately win because once you get groceries delivered to you uh, uh, into your fr front doors, you know, it's going to be hard to sort of go back to standing in the line in Costco when Instacart can actually deliver it for you and you get used to it. So there are some transformation that is going to happen because of COVID. I don't think the society will go back from. But having said that, uh, it's also not transformation for the sake of transformation. So speaking from our point of view, uh, data analytics, I sort of believe that the last three to four years, we have been sort of living in the renaissance of uh, 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 enterprise data analytics. Uh, and that's primarily because of three things. The first thing, every consumer is expecting no matter how small or the big business is to get to know them. You know, I don't want you to treat me like an average. I don't want you to treat me like a number, treat me like a person, which means understand me, but uh, personalize the services you are delivering and make sure that everything that you send me are relevant. So there's a marketing campaign or promo or customer support call, make sure it's relevant. So relevance and personalization. The second is in return for that, customers are willing to give you all sorts of data. The privacy, you know, be damned. So to a certain extent, they're giving you location information, medical information, to wearables. Stuff. And the last part is with cloud, the amount of data that you can collect and pre-process in data warehouse, like Snowflakes, like Redshift, it's, it's been fundamentally shifted. So when you tether them together, the customers, uh, you know, demand for better access from the business, the amount of data that they're willing to give and collect through IoT and wearables, and then cloud-based technologies that allows you to process and store this means that analyzing this data and then delivering relevant action to consumers is no longer a nice to have. And, and that I think is part of the reason why ThoughtSpot um, uh, is finding sort of a, a tailwind even with all this uh, global headwind that we are all facing. Well, I think too, you know, the, the innovation uh... Uh, a formula really has changed in our industry. I've said it many times, it's not Moore's law anymore. It's the combination of, of data plus, plus AI applied to that data and cloud for, for scale. And you guys are at the, at the heart of that. So I want to talk about you know, the market space a little bit. And you look at BI and analytics, you look at a market, you know, the Gartner Magic Quadrant, and to your point, you know, the, the companies on there are sort of chalk and cheese, to borrow a phrase from our friends across the pond. I mean, you're not Power BI, you're not SaaS. I mean, you're sort of search led, you're, you're turning natural language into, into complex SQL queries, you're bringing in artificial intelligence and machine intelligence to really simplify and, and dramatically expand uh, and put into the hands of, of business people analytics. So explain a little bit, 
first of all, do I have that sort of roughly right? And help us frame your, the market space and how you think about it. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it is amazing that the diverse industry and technologies that you speak to and how you are able to grasp all of them and summarize them within a matter of second plus this, which is a tremendous talent in itself. You and Stu, you both have that. <laughs> um, uh, you are absolutely right. So the way I think of this is that BI technologies have been uh, around and it's played out really well. It played its purpose. I mean, if you look at it, the way I think of BI, world's biggest BI tool is still Excel. People still want to use Excel and that is the number one BI tool ever. Then 10 years ago, Tableau came in and made visualization so delightful and epic, so to speak, that uh, uh, that became the better way to consume complex data. Then Microsoft came in, Power BI, and then commoditized the visualization to a point that uh, you know, Tableau had to fight and it ended up selling to uh, Salesforce. We are not trying to play there because I think if you chase the idea of visualization, it is going to be a long, hard journey for Prosper to catch Tableau and visualization. That's not what we are trying to do. What we are trying to do is that you have a lot of data on one hand and you have a consumer sitting here and saying, data doesn't mean you treated me well. Where is my action that is bespoke? Where is customized action? So our question is, how does data turn into bespoke action inside a business? The insurance company is calling, you're calling an insurance company's customer support person. How do you know that the, the impact that you are getting from them is customized? So turning data into insight is an algorithmic process. That's what BI does. But that's like a few people in an organization can do that. Uh, think of them like oil. They don't mix with water, that's the business people. The merchandising specialist who figures out which one should go to e-com, e-com site, and what should be the price, what should be the ranking, that's the merchandiser. The customer support person, that's a business user. They don't necessarily do Python or SQL. So what happens is in businesses, you have the data people like water and the business people who touch the customers and interact with them every day. They're like the water, they don't mix. The idea of ThoughtSpot is very simple. We don't want this demarcation. We don't want this chasm. We want to break it so that every single person who interacts with the customer should be able to have an interactive storytelling with the data so that every decision that they make takes data into insight, to knowledge, to action. And that decision-making pipeline cannot be gut-driven alone. It has to be enabled by data science and human experience coming together. So in our view, a well-deployed data platform, decision-making platform will enhance and augment human experience as opposed to human experience says this, data says it, so you got to pick one. That's an old model. And that has been the approach with the natural language based interactive access with the BI being done automated through AI in the back end. Uh, ThoughtSpot, we are able to put very complex data science in front of uh, a 20 year experienced uh, uh, merchandising specialist in a large uh, e commerce website uh, without learning Python, without learning SQL, without understanding data warehouse. Right, so a couple of things I want to pick up on. I mean, data is plentiful, insights aren't. That's really the takeaway yep. from one of the things that you mentioned. And this notion of storytelling is very, very important. I mean, all business people are, are, are you know, they better be storytellers in some way, shape, or form. And what better way to tell stories than with data? Uh, and so, uh, because as you say, it no longer gut feel is, is not the answer anymore. Um, so uh, uh, it seems to me, so these, that you guys are transformative. The decision to focus on the global 2000 uh, and really not you know, get washed up in the Excel, you know, well, I could just do it in Excel or I'm going to go get Power BI is good enough. It's really, you're trying to be transformative and you've got a really disruptive model that I, we talked about before, search led and, and, and you're speaking to the system or you know, typing in a way that's, that's more natural. I wonder if you could comment on that and, and particularly yeah. that, that disruption and that transformation. Remember, we are selling to Global 2000. Almost all of them will have Tableau or one of these Power BI or one of these solutions already. So we are not trying to go right. there and change that. What we have done is very clearly focus on use cases where transforming data into action will move the needle for the bit. So for example, with the COVID situation going on, one of the most popular use cases for us is around working capital management. Now, a CFO who's been in the business for 20, 30 years is an expert and have the right kind of gut feeling about how her business is running when it comes to working capital. However, 
imagine now she can do 20 what if scenarios in the next five seconds or next 10 minutes without going to the FPNA team, without going to the BI team. She can say, what if we reduce hiring in Japan and instead we focus them on Singapore? What if we move 20% of marketing dollars from Germany to New York? What would be the impact of AR going up by 1% versus AP going down by 1%? She needs to now do complex scenarios, but without delay. It's sort of like, how do I find a restaurant through Yelp versus going to the lobby to talk to a, a specialist who tells me the local restaurant? This, this interactive database storytelling where gut enhances the decision-making uh, is very powerful. This is why you know, customers has, our largest customer has spent more than $26 million with Hotspot. And this is not small deals. Our average deals are around close to 700K. Uh, uh, custom, like this week, for example, we are having a webinar where Verizon's SVP of analytics, specifically focused on finance, is actually going to be on a webinar with our CFO. So our CFO, uh, Sophie, one of our financial specialists, and Jeff Noto from Verizon are going to be on this talking about working capital management, what ThoughtSpot is a portion of, but they're sharing their experience of how do we manage. So that kind of very like, extremely rigid focus on use cases, supply chain, modeling different things so that uh, someone who knows Asia can really interact with the data to figure out if our supply chain from Bangladesh is gonna be impacted because of COVID, can we go to Ecuador? What will that look like? What will be the cost? What's the transportation cost, fuel cost? Business has become so complex, you don't have time to take five, six days to look at a report, no matter how pretty that report is, to make decisions. You need to be able to make lightning fast decisions. And, and something like COVID is really expo exposing all of that because day by day, uh, situation on the ground is changing. Uh, you know, employees are calling in sick, uh, virus is breaking out in one place, the other place it is not, curves are going up and down. Uh, so you cannot have any sort of delay uh, between human experience and data science. And all of that comes down to your point, telling visual uh, stories so that the organization can rally behind the changes the exec teams want to make. So these are mission critical use cases. There are big problems that you're, you're, you're solving and attacking. As you said, you're not all things to all people. Um, you, you're, one of the things you're not is a data store, right? So you've got a partner, you've got to have an ecosystem. Uh, whether it's you know cloud databases, the the cloud itself, I wonder if you could talk about some of the key partnerships that you're forming, and and how you're going to market and how that's affecting your business. Yeah, I mean one of the things that I've always believed in Silicon Valley is that companies uh, die out of indigestion, not out of starvation. You you try to do everything, uh, you know that's how you end up dying. And uh, for us in the space of data, it's an extremely humbling space because there is so much to do, data prep, data warehousing, you know, mashup of data, hosting of data. We have clearly decided that our ability is best spent on making artificial intelligence to work, interactive storytelling for business use, that's it. With that said, uh, we needed uh, high velocity agility partners in the back end and cloud-based data, cloud data warehouses have become a huge tailwind for us. Uh, because our entire uh, customer deployments are, are on cloud. And the number one, obviously, as you know from uh, Frank's thing, you know, Snowflake has actually given us, uh, 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 you know, customers have seen Snowflake plus Spot is actually a good uh, uh, thing. And we are exclusively on Global 2000 and you know, Snowflake is climbing up there and we are able to build a good uh, mutual partnership. But uh, we are also seeing really a creative partnership all the way from you know product design to go to market and compensation alignment with Amazon uh, on their push on Redshift as well. Uh, Google, we have announced partnership. There is a little bit of uh, teething troubles in the beginning we are getting. And just a couple of weeks ago, we started working with Microsoft on their Azure Synapses as well. Uh, I would say that it's uh, lagging. We still have uh, work to do, but uh, uh, Amazon and Snowflake are really uh, pushing uh, in terms of uh, what customers want to see. And it completely aligns with our value prop where one plus one equals uh, three uh, really works well for our customers. And, and Google is what, BigQuery plus, plus Google Cloud or what are you doing there? Yeah, so uh, all, both Amazon and Google, uh, uh, where what we are doing is three different pieces. One is obviously the hosting, uh, uh, their cloud platforms. Second is data warehouse, enterprise data warehouse, which is Redshift and BigQuery. And third, we are also pretty good at taking uh, uh, machine learning in, uh, uh, algorithms that they have built for specific uh, 
uh, verticals, able to take those and then ingest them and deliver better. So for example, uh, if you are uh, one of the largest apparel companies in the world and you want to know what's the shipment rate uh, from China and it shows, and then next thing you want to know is like, what's the failure rate on this based on last behavior when you compress the shipment rate. And, and that probably could use a bit of uh, specific algorithms and uh, you know Google and others have actually built library of algorithms that can be injected into ThoughtSpot. We will simply answer the question, uh, we may have gotten that algorithm from the Google library. Uh, so as the business use is concerned, uh, it doesn't really matter. So we have made all that invisible and we are able to deliver democratized access to bespoke insight to a business user uh, hitherto sort of been afraid to deal with the structured data. So as you mentioned that you've got obviously several hundred million dollars in cash, you've raised you know, over, a, uh, over half a billion. Uh, you've talked previously about potential acquisitions, about uh, IPO. Are you considering acquisitions, M&A at, at this point in time? I mean, there may be some, some deals out there. There's certainly some talent out there, but boy, the market's changing so fast. I mean, it seems to, you know, certain yeah. sectors are actually doing quite well. Uh, will you consider M&A at this point? Yeah, so I'll take IPO and m and two different. IPO definitely, uh, you know, it would be foolish to say that this hasn't pushed our clients back a little bit because uh, uh, this is a huge event. Uh, I think there will be a correction across uh, valuation and all of that. We need to keep, however, uh, it is also important for us to use this opportunity to look at how we are investing our resources and investment for long-term versus short-term and uh, make sure that we are more focused and more tightening up the belt. We are doing that internally. Having said that, being a private company, our valuation is you know, at least uh, in theory frozen. And then we have a pretty good cash position of close to $300 million, which means that it is absolutely an opportunity for us to uh, seriously consider m and The important thing, going back to my adage of uh, you know, companies don't die out of uh, uh, starvation, it is critical to make sure that whatever we do, we do it with clarity. Are we doing it for talent? Are we doing it for tech? Or are we doing it for market? When you have a massive event like this, it is a poor idea to go after new market. It is important to go to our existing customers who are very large global 2000 firms and then identify problems that we cannot solve otherwise and then add technology to solve those problems. So technology acquisitions are absolutely something to consider, but it needs some more time to settle in because you know, first two weeks were all, people were blindsided by this. Then the last two weeks, uh, we have now gotten the mojo back in sales and mojo back in engineering. And now I think uh, it is time for us to digest and prepare for this next two, three quarters of event. And as part of that, companies like us who are fortunate enough to be on a good cash position will absolutely look for uh, uh, interesting uh, and good deals uh, in the, uh, the M&A space. Yeah, it makes sense. It's talent and tech. You know, post IPO, you can worry about TAM expansion. You'll be under pressure to do that as the CEO. But for now, that's yeah. a very pragmatic approach. My last question is, some things, when you think about, you say five weeks now, you've been essentially on lockdown. You must, as many of us, start thinking about, wow, a lot of this work from home, um, which came so fast, people wouldn't even think about it earlier. You know, some, some companies mandated, uh, you know, the beehive approach. Now everybody's open to that. There are certain things that, that likely to remain permanent uh, post COVID. Have you thought much about that? Um, generally and specifically how it might affect your business, the permanence of post-COVID, your thoughts? Yeah, I've, uh, you know, I've thought a lot about it. In fact, this morning I was speaking with our CRO, Brian McCarthy, about this. I think the change will happen. Think of like an onion thinner most layer. I think the most, my, my hope is that the biggest change would be in every one of us uh, internally as a what sort of a person am I? And, and what does my position in the world means the ego of uh, each one of us that we carry, because if this global event in one shot did not make you rethink your own sort of position in this big universe, I think that's a miss. So the first thing has to be about being a better person. The second thing is, uh, uh, you know, I had this uh, two, three days of fever, which was negative for COVID, but I isolated myself, but that gave me sort of an idea of sitting in a dark room where I'm hoping my family won't get infected. Uh, uh, and my, you know, my parents are in India, so, it sort of also realized that what is really important for you in life and how much family should mean to you. So that's those are first yourself, second, your relationship with family. But having said that, the most, uh, the third thing when, when it comes to business building is also the importance of building with quality people. Because when things go wrong, uh, it is so critical to have 
people who believe in the purpose of what you are trying to build, people with good faith and unshakable faith, uh, personal faith and unshakable faith in the purpose of the company. And most importantly, you mentioned something which is the storytelling, people, leaders who can absolutely communicate with clarity and certainty. It becomes uh, the most important thing to lead an organization. I mean, you are a small business owner, you know, we are a you know, small company with around 500 people. Uh, it, it, there is nothing like uh, sitting at home, waiting to see how the company is doing over email. If you're a frontline engineer or a seller, cl- communication becomes so critical. So having the trust and the respect of the organization uh, to, and have the ability to clearly and transparently communicate the most important thing for the company and over communicating during the time of crisis. These things are so useful, even after this crisis is over. Obviously, from a technology point of view, you know, people have been speaking a lot about working remotely and technology changes, security, those things will happen. But I think if these three things were to happen in that order, be a better person, be a better family member and be a better leader, I think the world will be better off. And the last thing I'll also tell you that, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, sometimes we have this uh, disregard for arts and literature and science, uh, over science. I, I hope that goes away uh, because I can't imagine living without books, without movies, without Netflix, and everything uh, art majors have created to enrich our lives. You know, sports is no longer uh, there on TV. Uh, and the fact that people are able to immerse their imagination in books and fiction and watch TV, and other, that also reminds you how important it is to have a good balance between arts and science in this world. So I have a long list of things that I hope we as a people and as a society will get better at. Yeah, a lot more game playing in uh, in our household, and and it's it's good to reconnect in that regard. Well, Sadish, you've always been a very clear thinker, and you're in a great spot, um, an awesome leader. Thanks so much for coming on the Cube. It was really great to see you again. All the best to you, your family, and the broader community in your area. David, you've been very kind with this. Thank you so much. I wish you the same, and hopefully, we'll get to see face to face in the near future. Thanks a lot. I, I hope so. Thank you. All right, and thank you for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube, and. We'll see you next time.